Okay, good afternoon, everybody. As I say, my name is Michael Collins, and you're all very welcome uh, to this afternoon's very timely, if I may put it, webinar discussion here at the IIEA. As I say, I'm uh, the Director General here at the IIEA in Dublin. I'm conscious of the fact that we've got people joining us, not just from Ireland uh, and from elsewhere as well, Europe and indeed beyond. We're absolutely delighted uh, this afternoon to be joined at this critical moment, if I may call it that, a hinge moment, perhaps, uh, by Ambassador Mick Mulvaney, the US Special Envoy uh, for Northern Ireland, and of course, former White House Chief of Staff to President Trump. And as we continue to digest uh, Tuesday's election and what it means, uh, he will offer us a US perspective on the safeguarding of the Good Friday Agreement, and I'm sure he may also offer his uh, perspective on, on more current issues as well. Let me formally introduce uh, Ambassador Mulvaney, uh, who is uh, who's sworn in as United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland in May 2020 and prior to his appointment. Uh, Ambassador Mulvaney served in President Trump's cabinet as acting White House uh, Chief of Staff and concurrently as Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Ambassador Mulvaney represented South Carolina's fifth district in the US House of Representatives from 2011 to 2017. And he was a member of the South Carolina General Assembly from 2007 to 2011. Before entering public service, uh, he practiced law and worked in his family's real estate business. And he holds a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and a law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before I hand over to Ambassador Mulvaney, just a few housekeeping uh, issues, if I may. This full event, both the initial uh, presentation by Ambassador Mulvaney and the question and answer session, uh, which will follow, are both on the record. And you can join the discussion using uh, Zoom's dedicated Q&A function, which I'm sure at this stage in this Zoom world of ours, everybody is now very, very familiar with. And I would encourage you to submit your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, or indeed after Mul uh, Ambassador Mulvaney has finished his remarks. Uh, please do so then also if you wish to do so. Please identify yourself when submitting your question, your name and your affiliation if applicable. And lastly, we encourage you to join the conversation, which we, sure, we are pretty sure is going to be a lively conversation on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And with that, Ambassador Mulvaney, Mick, you're very, very welcome to Dublin virtually. We hope we can welcome you in <laughs> in, in person at some time in the, in the in the future. But in these days that are in it, we're very, very uh, thankful for the fact that you're here. And I'm now going to hand over to you. The floor is all yours. Michael, it's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I do wish I could be there uh, in person as well. Um, it's not for lack of desire to be there, I can assure you. Um, it's a good time to have this conversation. There's very little else going on in the world. Uh, nothing happening in my country to speak of. So um, it's a good time to give uh, Northern Ireland a, our undivided attention. Um, uh, in serious note, what, what, what I thought I would do, if it's okay with you and with the group, is, uh, is talk a little bit about my trip, a little bit about where I see uh, U.S. policy on Northern Ireland is standing now, and then we'll throw it open to questions because my guess is, and it could be an educated guess, we might have as many questions about other topics uh, of the day um, in addition to those uh, 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 revolving around uh, U.S. policy in that part of the world. So um, as many of you may know, if you follow the topic, and my guess is if you're on this call, you do, um, that I was over uh, for the very first time the end of September. We had tried a couple of times to come prior to that, um, circumstances as it were conspired against us. Um, I'm very much aware of, of the political um, realm, uh, the political environment in many places, in my country, your country. And by pure coincidence, I was scheduled to come over uh, first time, I believe right on the tail end of the story funeral in Belfast, made it probably not the best time for me to visit. And then the second time I was scheduled to come was right on the tail end of what I think um, y'all refer to now as golf gate so i was happy to finally find a calmer time and come uh, end of september and i'm glad that i did i had a chance i spent two days in in dublin three in belfast and then two in london I had a chance to meet just about um, everybody that you would expect uh the sort of the top tier folks you're supposed to meet uh with the exception i think of um michelle in uh in northern ireland she had been ill not with covid i want to point out when i was there so i did not get a chance to meet with her, although I've met with her obviously several, several, several times uh, virtually. Uh, I came for several reasons, but the one thing that was on the front of my mind was uh, the impact of the internal markets bill in the UK um, and uh, Brexit on the Good Friday Belfast agreements. Um, 
I had been in, in constant communication with, uh, with Richie Neal and his office, uh, which is a friend of mine and from a colleague who served together in the House. He and Peter King are the chair of the Irish caucus. And they're both uh, had just written a letter, I believe, expressing some concern over the impact of the internal markets bill on the Good Friday Bill Fast Agreement and then um, threatened, I guess is the best way to put it, um, that uh, if things went sideways, um, that that would negatively impact a US-UK free trade agreement. Keep in mind, not only is Richie Neal heavily involved in Irish matters in the United States Congress, he's also the chairman of the very powerful Ways and Means Committee and will remain so after the election of a couple of days ago. Uh, our Ways and Means Committee has a uh, power to approve or disapprove under current uh, practices, uh, any free trade agreement that we enter into. So the administration negotiates it, but the House and the Senate approve it. Therefore, Mr. Neal um, is a, certainly a relevant party to those discussions. Um, so I was interested in the income markets bill. I was interested primarily in what I, I take into referring to as an, a border by accident. Um, I think everybody um, says the right things, certainly about uh, not wanting a border across the island of Ireland. The British don't want it. The Irish don't want it. The Europeans don't want it. My concern was that um, I, I wanted to make sure that folks were aware, as we were aware in this country, of the potential for one by accident, where no one really wants it, um, but it ends up happening anyway. Um, I, I put that matter uh, to just about everybody. In fact, everybody, when I was over there, I get the best response I got um, to the matter from Simon Coveney um, when I met with him in Dublin. And what I said was, look, Simon, my fear is this, is that there's a no deal Brexit, the IMB kicks in, um, the Brits don't want to put up a border across the island because they know what that means. The Irish don't want to put up a border across the island because they know what that means. But the Europeans come in and say, well, if you're not going to control the flow of goods from outside of the Union, inside the Union, from Belfast to Dublin for sake of this discussion, then we're going to force you to ring the whole island of Ireland in order to protect the European markets. Um, and that would put tremendous pressure on the Irish to do something. And Simon was the one who said, Nick, I can see it uh, in theory. I can see it penciled out on a piece of paper, but in reality, there's much larger, more powerful levers the Europeans could pull under those circumstances than uh, a border across the island of Ireland. He said, added to the, and the example he gave for, uh, was um, commercial aviation. It goes to the heart of, it goes to, it sticks to the, the, gets to the British someplace that's a little bit closer to home, perhaps, uh, and a larger economic impact. Um, and he also uh, referenced that um, and made a, a case for, and it was reinforced by other people, um, that folks understand the implications of, of, of something, of a border across the island. My concern was that while it's recent history and lived history uh, amongst the leaders of, of both Northern Ireland and the Republic and of the UK, that there might be elements in Europe, especially amongst younger leaders, for whom it's learned history and, and it doesn't have the same sort of visceral impact as folks who, um, who have different life experiences. At to a man and to a woman, everybody assured me that the interests were truly aligned, not just in words, but in commitment from the UK to the Republic, to, 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 uh, to Brussels, that um, folks are aware of, of, of what a border uh, in Northern Ireland would mean um, and what it would represent. Um, it was one of the Europeans who actually mentioned to me that um, they perceived the Good Friday agreements as being one of the true success stories of Europe. Um, that it was a, a circumstance where Europe was able to solve its problems in what has so far been a, 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 a long-standing and a firm sort of manner. It's not a tenuous sort of circumstance. And they compared it in their minds to what's happening, say, on a daily basis in the Balkans. And they wanted to preserve that victory and they were going to make sacrifices in order to do so. That, um, that, that reassured me uh, on several levels that, uh, that, it, that while I, there's still a risk of a border, certainly there always is, um, that everyone, I think, is paying the appropriate attention to it. And that has been my message to my administration, to the Trump administration, excuse me, and to my friends in, the, in, in Congress, is that, yeah, we will continue to monitor it. We will continue to watch it. We will continue to be an interested third party in it. Um, but that I think the temperature came down dramatically um, after my trip. Um, we talked a little bit also about the, the internal markets bill and so forth and the impact of, of, of that. Um, Again, uh, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, as I think uh, most, but maybe many people are in Europe and in, in, in the UK, that there will be some sort of deal um, with, the, with the EU by the UK before the end of the year. Again, it was Simon Coveney who very clearly articulated um, that he believes it to be in everyone's best interest and everyone believes it to be in their own best interest to get a deal. 
the, the British want a deal, the Europeans want a deal. And my experience in life and in politics has been that's when deals tend to get done. The real difficult time becomes when one side wants a deal and another does not. Um, but after talking with Simon, I talked to him very early in my trip, that message was sort of reaffirmed. Everybody I talked to said that they, everyone wants a deal and they perceive it in their own best political interest to do so. And, and that's, that's, that's important. I think, of course, Johnson thinks it's in best interest. It's more likely he gets a deal. Same is true in Brussels. Um, I did walk away thinking um, that the, the nature of the deal, the scope of the deal would be somewhat limited. It may cover, for example, the flow of goods um, in terms of some type of free trade agreement, but also might cover state aid to some extent. And as is always the case um, in European discussions, fishing. Uh, I don't say that dismissively. We have similar issues in the United States. Corn and soybeans uh, run sort of this, and sugar run sort of the same emotional political uh, gamuts that, uh, that fishing does, in, apparently does in Europe. Um, but if you can get sort of that slim down deal by the end of the year, it takes a lot of pressure uh, because flow of goods speaks to a lot of the issues that are raised by the IMB. Um, by the way, and I did also leave um, with a very distinct impression that the disputes um, about the departure right now tend to do focus more on state aid than they do on the flow of goods. I mentioned that only in that um, I think that's 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 probably it's harder to negotiate, um, but easier to sort of get your head around as a bureaucrat. Uh, the flow of goods uh, can be emotional and so forth. It's very visible. It's easy for the media to spin. State aid is really boring, and sometimes it's easy to get uh, better deals or easier to get a deal on on boring matters. Um, Michael, I, I can do another ten minutes if you wanted me to, but again, I'm not sure how much folks want to talk about this versus the election or both. So, um, <laughs> if you think it's best to throw it over to questions, we can start. We don't have any questions. I can I can drone on some more and put more people to sleep. Yeah, well, and Mick, that, that's great. Uh, uh, just uh, we can do both. In fact, uh, and let me just uh, maybe get get the ball rolling while we're waiting for the questions to uh, to, to to flow. Um, and uh, you, you just in relation to the. Um, uh, well, uh, the, the election, I suppose. I mean, uh, and 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 your your role as as a, as as a special representative. To what extent, I mean, is uh, Irish America, uh, and you're a very strong Irish American. American. To what extent is Irish uh, America um, a relevant factor or a factor at all uh, in American current American politics? I mean, is it? Uh, and at what level of support, for example, uh, would would uh, President Trump? attract from uh, the, the very large Irish American community? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question and a difficult question to answer um, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, there's so many of us. Um, number two, um, when you look at how many of us there are of Irish Americans, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to sort of quantify how many folks identify as Irish Americans. Richie Neal absolutely does. I absolutely do. We're, we know our heritage, we're involved in our heritage, interested in the outcomes of, of that part of the world. And there's other folks who are probably as Irish as I am, if not more so, who don't follow the issue. So it's sort of hard, it's sort of hard to quantify, to put your, your fingers on it. Secondly, they don't vote as a block. They're very geographically diverse. So it's sort of, it's hard to say what the Irish American influence on politics is. Hispanics, by comparison, concentrated in a couple of areas still, a, a much more tight-knit community. Um, of course, not been here historically as long, certainly some of them have, but not traditionally uh, would, would be a newer immigrant, immigrant group. Um, Indian Americans, similarly, lots of them, not as many obviously as us, um, but concentrated in a couple areas. So um, it's sort of hard to put your finger on the Irish American community in terms of the voting. Same is true, by the way, uh, amongst the Catholic vote. Um, uh, they tend to be a little bit more uh, geographically centered, which is why um, uh, this year, for example, we had a, a Catholics for Trump effort. I think we probably had an Irish Americans Trump for, 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 for uh, effort, but uh, I'm familiar with one and not at the other, which tells you a little bit about the priority it got. Um, but the, the Irish Catholics are, are focused heavily in the cities in the Rust Belt. So yes, you know about Boston, you know about New York, but there's huge communities in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, uh, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in Minneapolis and so forth. And, Four or five of those are, uh, you're probably familiar with those being critical swing states. So um, it's almost impossible to say. I've heard some data that said that the Catholics came out for Trump by about 60 to 40. But there again, very difficult to quantify. Um, I identify as a Catholic. If I got asked in a pollster, in a, a pollster calls me and asks me if I'm Roman Catholic, I would say that I would. And I say I go to church once a week. My daughter um, might say that she's Catholic, though I'm hard pressed to get her to go at Christmas and Easter. So 
um, it's it, again, it's 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 a nebulous group when you talk about Irish Americans, Irish Catholic Americans, and it's very difficult to sort of say they vote this way or the other. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. That's a long answer for being such a bad answer. Yeah, I think one of the the, the um, I mean, it's been a fact over the, the last uh, several decades that we've had um, bipartisanship uh, in the United States uh, regarding Northern Ireland, and all the more so uh, uh, since the since the Good Friday Agreement. Very very strong bipartisanship. Uh, I mean. Obviously, uh, both the administration, uh, President Trump's administration, uh, through your good self, and uh, people like Richie Neal and uh, Speaker Pelosi, they came out very, very strongly. You came out very, very strongly. To what extent, in, in relation to the uh, internal markets bill and uh, the need for no hard border in Ireland, to what extent was that coordinated or was it something that uh, spontaneously, as it were, the, the administration represented by you uh, felt that you, you should do um, a, 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 as the right thing to do by Ireland, as it were, and by, by, by Northern Ireland? Right? Yeah, your first point is excellent uh, and, and worth uh, a little bit of discussion. And then I'll talk about that specific outreach on the IMB, um, is that um, there's a saying here now that there's only really two things that are bipartisan in the United States Congress, in fact, in the United States government. One is antipathy towards China and the other is support for the island of Ireland. Keep in mind, in this country, when you talk about Irish Americans, it's folks who are from the island. Um, many of our families, including mine, came over when uh, before partition. So Irish America is, 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 is the island um, and support for that, for the entire island is bipartisan, which is why one of the many reasons we have a Northern Irish envoy. Um, as to, um, and that's encouraging by the way. And I can give you an example, which was in the letter that Richie, that Richie wrote regarding the IMB. I saw the letter, Richie did not pre-clear it with me. That wouldn't be necessary or appropriate. That's we, he's in a different a branch of the government and we don't ask for permission before of Congress before we do most things and they don't ask permission of the administration. Um, but it was entirely consistent with our position. I talked to Richie about it right after he came out. I talked to Peter King as well, David Joyce, Brendan Boyle, young man from Philadelphia who's good friends with me, who's sort of um, establishing himself in the Irish American community in this country. Um, and what we decided was that the letter was very helpful. The letter was more aggressive than I would have written it as. And the way I described it to people both here and over there is that I, I consider that to be a difference of assumptions, a, a difference of assumptions on perspective. I, I view that letter as being written as assuming the internal markets bill was going to damage the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and my position is that um, if the, the, uh, the administration's position is if the uh, internal markets bill does damage the Good Friday Agreements, then there would be impact on the UK U.S. trade agreement. So I know it's a subtle difference. I hope I'm making that difference uh, readily apparent. Um, uh, the letter seems to think that, that damage is already done. Our position was that we were worried about the potentialities for damage. But I thought it was very helpful because it got attention to the subject. I told Richie as much um, that he was completely comfortable with our position as an administration. So um, look, again, both parties uh, support the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. They do. Um, and um, the one thing I pushed back, and I gave Brendan Boyle a, a hard time about this because he said we, uh, we were guarantors, and I think he may have said we signed it. I sent him a copy and pointed out to him that, um, that we are not guarantors. That's a legal term, and not, neither have we signed it, but we have a tremendous vested interest in it. Uh, and I just want to make that clear. We do not consider ourselves to be guarantors of that agreement. That is specifically the governments of the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. So um, just, to, just to clarify that, we recognize our role. Uh, we recognize that um, that we are a third party here, not a first party, um, but that our role can be to help and to assist and to be, I hope, a credible uh, intermediary and interlocutor when the necessary time comes. Um, but uh, I think that everybody over here gets that subtle uh, difference. Mick, just if if, um, if it was uh, felt that um, if there was a um, uh, if there was controversy around the continuation of the internal market bill and uh, its possible damage to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, whose assessment do you think would count for most with you? Uh, would it be, well, I mean, maybe I shouldn't even put it in these terms, but I mean, obviously you, you may well have a UK view saying it does not. You may well have an Irish and a European view which says that it does. Uh, how would you weigh up the, uh, the, the, the how would you weigh up the, the, the contrary advice there? Yeah, I, I got asked, um, every now and then you get asked those really, really slick kind of questions. Not that that is one, but I got it put a different way. I was speaking to a, uh, a think tank in Ireland, in, in, the, in London, and they said, look, if it comes down to picking between the Irish and the British, which, who are you gonna side with? And I just laughed and I said, look, we're working hard to not have to make those kinds of decisions because these are our, our two closest friends in the whole world. The Australians always get upset when I say that, but it's true, I mean, face it. Um, so uh, I think we'll make our own decisions when it comes down to it, um, Michael. Um, 
clearly if a border goes up, um, and let's not even, I don't even want to contemplate that because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, uh, but if it comes down to, uh, we are interested in seeing um, the North, uh, Northern Ireland stay stable because we think that is the key to economic uh, success and that is the key to permanent peace uh, in that part of, uh, of the world. Um, and we will look at anything that happens from any party that undermines that as something that we would be pushing back against. Um, so your example is a good one. What if the IMB damages it? That will certainly the IMB is a piece of British legislation. We think that, that there should be consequences to the British for that. Let me bring balance to that discussion and say, well, if it looks like the Irish and the British have worked out a situation as to how to move goods across the border, and the Europeans are the ones making all sorts of difficulties, and that leads to, uh, to, to instability, then they should bear the consequences from that. So I, I, I know I'm, I'm trying to, I may sound like I'm trying to be um, diplomatic, but that's sort of my job these days when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, okay, well. I do think this, I do think this, um, and I told my European friends this as well. I said, look, I, I, I don't, I don't get the, the issue on the flow of goods because they are so small. Uh, the flow of goods from UK to NI is small to begin with. The, flow, the onward flow of goods right now from UK to NI to the Republic is so small. Any, any significant addition to that would stand out like a sore thumb if the British start shipping Rolls Royces into Belfast in order to avoid some theoretic European tariff and then drive them down to Dublin to sell them, you'd be able to see that and do something about it. Um, and that's when um, the Europeans made it clear to me that this was that they were not interested in the practicalities, they were interested in the legalities. And I thought that was an interesting perspective, one that I had missed. I'm more of a practical person, but uh, I, I appreciate that, that, uh, that perspective. And it, it has helped inform sort of the discussions as we move forward. Okay, before we just head into the questions, one last one from me, Mick, before I, I, I yield the floor to uh, all the questions that are coming in. And this just happens to be uh, terribly topical and relevant today. Um, there was a very, very major announcement in, in Antrim uh, today that, that the Caterpillar plant, the US Caterpillar plant is closing down uh, with the loss of 700 jobs. So just um, and in the past, and uh, you know, the United States administrations have been very active in kind of um, assisting uh, inward investment, uh, encouraging inward investment into Northern Ireland. Indeed, you've hosted uh, at times in the past in inward investment um, um, uh, events to, to facilitate that. So. Uh, how do you think, I mean, a Trump administration, which is what you can speak to, um, are there any steps that, that can be taken to better support uh, Northern Ireland economically in these circumstances? Obviously, we're all uh, suffering uh, through the economic consequences of COVID. Uh, but, I mean, would you be open to, for example, some new initiatives there, like an investment conference or uh, other ideas in relation to underpinning the Northern Ireland's economy, particularly in kind of in the light of the kind of news that we got today or that people in Northern Ireland got today in Antrim, 700 jobs lost uh, through Caterpillar? Yeah, and I, I, I saw that and I was uh, it struck fairly close to home to me in my, there's no reason for you to know this, but in my former congressional district, um, we had a very rural area down in the very far southern end of, of, of my state um, where they had almost an exactly similar sized caterpillar plant. Um, and it was at risk of closing several times during the recession. And I couldn't help but think, what would that do to that community? So I, that, that it's a lived experience for me. So, um, but come back, you mentioned the, the key word there and I think all that, which is COVID. Um, good news, bad news there. Um, the, 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 the good news, part of the good news, I'll go back and forth between the two, is that my first trip, I had hoped that the first trip, in addition to being introductory, when we planned this back in May, uh, was going to focus on almost exclusively on economic development. Um, I had had a chance to come over to Northern Ireland and to Dublin and Belfast in February when I was still the chief of staff. Uh, I, with my president, I, the president and I talked about a transition. I was sort of uh, anticipating becoming the Northern, uh, the, the, the special envoy. So I had a chance to come over and sort of get a feel for what Northern Ireland thought it wanted to be in terms of future economic development. And just by pure coincidence, when we start talking about FinTech, financial technology, I'm extraordinarily well connected in that particular part of the world. I'm the founder of the Bitcoin uh, ca Caucus in, in, in Congress, the Blockchain Caucus. I'm on the board of directors of the National Digital Chamber of Commerce, one of the leading um, uh, uh, trade associations for FinTech. Um, and I was hoping very much to, to, to introduce those folks from the U.S. to the, the appropriate people in Northern Ireland. And of course, COVID hit. And we still talk about those things. But those are the types of deals, Michael, that need to take place. Uh, they need to get done face to face. Um, so more good news on COVID is that and I recognize the last couple of weeks have been a setback uh, on COVID. And if you're looking for good news in COVID, you're always straining anyway. But one of the messages I think I've taken away from 
uh, my involvement with Northern Ireland over the last uh, six months has been that they did handle COVID extraordinarily well for the first six months. And it was a unifying event uh, amongst the devolved government that they had a common enemy in COVID. They dealt, they, um, they got their, uh, their uh, R0 rate down very, very low early on. They were contained very early on and they performed extraordinarily well. And in my mind, that's a selling point going forward when you're looking for direct foreign investment for inward investment is like, look, if we go through this again, we know how to handle it. Um, and they've done better, for example, than the Indians and the uh, South Americans with whom they may be competing for some of those fintech investments. So that was all the good news. The bad news obviously was that we couldn't have those meetings. Uh, I'm eager to have them. Um, I will say this, I'll probably make news by saying this, but um, should the president um, lose the election, uh, my guess is I will not be retained as special envoy to Northern Ireland. That's completely understandable and to be expected under our system. Uh, I intend fully to stay involved in that economic um, standpoint. I can do it with my hat on from that digital chamber of commerce. It would be in their best interest to find places to do business overseas. And now that I know what I know about Northern Ireland, uh, I'll be trying to sell that to those folks um, directly, even uh, should my official duties end. Okay, uh, that actually, uh, the question I just asked there echoes a question that just since came in from Fergal O'Brien from IBEX, our, 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 our employers um, um, group. Uh, very much along the same lines. So I think you've covered the point there, but maybe just coming to a few questions now, Tony Connolly, whom you may know, uh, who's the RTE um, distinguished correspondent in Brussels. He, he says if, if, uh, if uh, uh, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden is elected, what impact might that have on UK US free trade agreement and on the internal market bill? Yeah, I got asked that question a couple of times on TV over the last couple of hours. Um, um, and I, I don't think much. I, I don't. I have no idea who uh, who the vice president, then the uh, the assumed the president elect, would put in this position. But again, the policies of, of, of the Trump administration, the policies of the Democrats who are in charge of, of of the House, are pretty much aligned to begin with. So I do not see a dramatic shift. Um, the Democrats in Congress want a free trade agreement with the UK. They also want to protect the Good Friday agreements that you just described. The Trump policy as well. So we would like to see. Both of those things take place concurrently. Um, so I do not see a dramatic change. Um, I got also got asked, by the way, um, about international trade with places like China. I'm like, look, I really don't think the trade policies will change that much. If Donald Trump um, was accused of anything during his first days of his administration, it was he was taking a fairly democratic view towards trade, which was a little bit more protectionist. Um, so I don't expect a Democrat president to then go back in and, and start being the free trader in the, in, 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 in the government. So no, I don't expect dramatic changes. You might hear the language change. Um, certainly uh, President Biden, President Trump, uh, assumed President Biden and President Trump have different styles, uh, different mannerisms and so forth. So the, the, the delivery might change, the style might change, the volume might be different, but I don't think the substance will change much. Yeah, um, um, a few questions in around the same subject um, from Adam Payne, who's a political reporter at Business Insider. He says, um, hello, uh, Ambassador Mulvaney, there are reports that the UK government is going to decide its next move in trade negotiations with the EU once uh, the outcome of the US presidential election has been confirmed. Uh, do, he says, do you think a, new, a no trade um, a deal uh, Brexit deal and its potential ramifications for Northern Ireland would be more palatable, palatable for a Trump administration uh, than a Biden administration? Um, you know, that's the first I've heard of that. Um, and uh, I mean, fully, uh, full disclosure, I'm not um, involved in any discussions anymore between my government and the, and the British government at that level. Certainly, I have my portfolio as a special envoy, but um, I would discourage the, uh, the, the British government from, from waiting to determine that the, the, the outcome of the election for no other reason that, that that timeline might not be as quick as people think it should be or want it to be. I would like it to be over yesterday, but there's a better than average chance, and maybe we could talk about this later in the Q&A, this doesn't get resolved until late November, early December. Um, I'll tell why that is maybe an answer to another, another question, but um, seriously, if you're the British government and you want to deal by the end of the year, um, what if you don't know who the president's going to be until January 15th? That could be a, a self-defeating sort of assumption. So even putting the policies aside, I think the practicalities would encourage the British uh, not to delay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Simon Carswell, whom you may have known um, as the Irish Times correspondent in, in Washington um, some years ago, um, has a question here. He says, my question is on the 
presidential election, uh, in Ambassador Mulvaney's view, is the Trump administration's decision to take legal actions over the voting in certain uh, states a sign that the president is, at least privately, conceding that Joe Biden has won the election? And do uh, the president's actions risk undermining public trust and confidence in the democratic oh, and, process? And Simon knows, I'm sorry, that was from Simon? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, Simon knows the answer to that question. He knows just as well as anybody watching this, Cam, and I, I don't mean to give him a hard time, but I'm going to give him a hard time, which is lawsuits are part of close elections. They just are. I was stunned at the coverage we got, not only domestically, but overseas, when people said, oh, my goodness, the president is lawyering up in anticipation of a close election. I got news for you. Everybody was lawyering up. Lawyers are part of our system here. I ran for the state legislature in 2006, a little tiny piece of my county in South Carolina. I would have I was ended up representing 35,000 people. We had three lawyers on the team and they had to do things on election day. Our election system, Michael, is people think it's this high tech, centralized 21st century sort of you know juggernaut. It's not, it's run locally. It's run in gymnasiums and churches and high schools, mostly by volunteers who might have a couple hours of training. Machines break down, people lose stuff. This happens all the time, the lawsuits in, 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 my, um, in my election, whether or not uh, a, a place that couldn't open on time because people couldn't find the keys to the gym would then have to stay open later at night to make up for the lost time. It took us 12 days um, after election day to determine the, the outcome of that little tiny election in South Carolina. So it should not surprise anybody that there are lawyers and should not surprise anybody that there are lawsuits. And it is not a tacit admission of loss any more than it is a, a, a declaration of victory. And I can assure you that the Biden team probably has more lawyers involved in the Trump team because as of last week, they had more money, um, which is usually what, um, uh, what translates into, into lawyers. Um, as to undermining public trust, look, I got asked what I assumed was a, um, was a joke question by a, a European outlet. Um, and in hindsight, I wish I had not treated it as such. And I should have treated it more as, as an insight as to, as to how distorted the perception is of my country overseas. I got asked a question as to whether or not Donald Trump was mounting a coup um, in, uh, after his, uh, in the question came on the heels of his, his speech uh, the night of the election, the night after the election, when he said that uh, he thought he had won the election. Uh, and I, I laughed it off and I shouldn't have, and I apologize for that. Um, it, in my mind though, it is a joke. Um, th no, the answer is, 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 is unabashedly, that, that's a crazy question to ask. Um, and it, it either the, the person doesn't understand America, doesn't understand elections, or has such biased information going in that they really think that is a legitimate question to ask. Every politician on the night of a close election thinks he or she has won. Go back and read, if you, re if you read the text of what the president said two days ago, and then read the text of what Joe Biden said yesterday, they're not that different. They both think they have won. They both think they're going to be proven the winner. Um, they both uh, are going to do what they can to, to make sure that the law is followed, and they both want the law to be followed um, uh, uh, judiciously and faithfully. That, that's, that's standard operating stuff for any American politician. What you saw over the course of those two speeches is the different style of the two men. Um, there will be, let me make these perfectly clear, it, it, to the extent there's any doubt, and I've been on the inside of the Trump administration in an unparalleled fashion, there will be a, a peaceful transition or retention of power come January 20th, period, end of story. Could things get really sloppy and messy and slow between now and then? Absolutely. They were, by the way, in 2000 as well, yet we managed to, to, to work through it. That will happen. An American election can be a sloppy, ugly thing. It's sort of like making law. We describe it as making sausage. No one wants to see it happen, but you enjoy the final product. Um, you're going to see that over the course of the next days, if not weeks here. Uh, but it is not a, nothing that you're seeing is a tacit admission of this or that or weakness or strength. It's politicians being politicians, doing what they are supposed to do, given the fact that on one hand, 70 million people supported one candidate and 68 million or whatever it is supported the other. Um, they feel an obligation to those folks to fight this out to the very end, which I absolutely expect from both candidates. And Mick, just um, apropos of that, um, um, it is uh, given... Given, given the 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 the, the, um, the kind of the, the strength of the kind of the positions of uh, both candidates, I mean, it, 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 and, and and the kind of the even Stephen nature of the incredible number of votes that were cast for each candidate. I mean, I think uh, Biden is up around 70 million now. The president is 65, 66, something like that. Huge numbers. Is, is the U.S. Uh, capable, I suppose, today of uniting around 
a, a new president, uh, if, it, if it were to be uh, President Biden, um, you know, can the country come together again? To us on the outside, it seems yeah. fractured to the point where this almost seems implausible or, or very difficult. Yeah, and, and let's keep on. I will answer your question. I, I know you do the best of my ability, but I, I will preface this by saying this. Tell me how that's different than Britain. Tell me how that's different than Spain. Tell me how that's different than Italy. Tell me how that's different than many countries around the world right now. It's just, I think Spain went three years without having a government. Britain is still ripping it itself over Brexit. So um, can we come together? Yeah, I think we can. Um, the question, there's a couple questions there. Um, number one, um, do we want to? There's still, there's still a, lot of, a lot of concern there as to whether or not we want to. Um, but that's a, that's a philosophical question that, that bears a longer discussion for another day. So let's stick to the topic at hand, which is the two leaders. Are either of these two leaders likely to unite the country? No. Um, Donald Trump, uh, that's, that's, not, that's not his style. It's not his personality. That's, not, that's just not what he's, I don't think he's interested in uniting the country, at least in the way that, um, that other folks would define it. His, his idea of uniting the country is, is giving everybody a job, having a successful economy, um, having peace and prosperity worldwide and let everybody do what they want to do. That's, that's, that's his idea of, of unity. Um, on the other hand, is Joe Biden capable of it? I think Joe Biden's absolutely capable of it individually, but his party has zero interest in doing it. Um, he does not have the ability. You've not heard Joe Biden make any center left arguments in this, in this, in this uh, campaign over the course of the last several weeks. In fact, he probably makes a se few arguments at all because Rightly so. He, he wanted the election to be about the president and not about Joe Biden. So I don't fault him for that. But you've not heard him pushing back against Elizabeth Warren. You've not heard him back pushing against Bernie Sanders. Not heard him back against um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because the energy and the center of gravity right now in the Democrat Party is on the far left, just as it is, by the way, in my party. It's on the far right, which is why I go back to that question about whether or not we want to unite. But again, I'm putting that aside. I don't think that Joe Biden has what it takes to force his party by his own will into being a conciliatory um, um, uh, movement towards the Republicans. I think that comes to the next election. I think 2024, um, everybody says this was the most important election of our time. I think in hindsight, it probably was not. We end up with divided government now one way or the other. 2024 will be very, very interesting to me and who the Democrats and who the Republicans offer in that role as the great uniter. I think both parties have the ability to do it if they get the right strong leader who comes to the table with that sort of message and is elected based upon that message. Um, whether or not either party is capable of electing such a person in a primary remains to be seen. Uh, but the short answer to your question is no, I don't think we see much difference over the course of the next four years we've seen over the last four. And I look with great interest um, to the 2024 election as that possible fork in the road for the United States. And um, for 2024, I mean, if, if President uh, Trump is, is defeated now these days, uh, would he, and people talk about him, you know, remaining on the scene, uh, having a an alternative White House in uh, um, uh, Mar-a-Lago, uh, I mean, is he somebody who who you think could re-enter the political um, um, the presidential scene in 2024? And is he that man that you're talking about as being at that point the uniter at, at that fork in the road? Michael, you've asked a good question. I've only got that question one time for the American press. So uh, kudos to you to going straight to the heart of the matter. And that they put it a different way, which is <clears throat> after this election is over, who is the leading Republican candidate for 2024? And I think now folks are starting to realize, wait a second, if Donald Trump loses, he might be the guy. And I'm telling you, absolutely. I would absolutely expect the, the, the president to stay involved in politics and would absolutely put him on the short list of people who are likely to run in 2024. He doesn't like losing. Plus, don't lose sight of the fact that he will be, I think, technically younger than Joe Biden is four years now, four years from now. And I, I, the stories about his, his energy level and the fact that he doesn't sleep and his, 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 uh, his viva vivaciousness are true. That's not, that's not the stuff of, of, of spin. He just, he's a very high energy 74 year old. So I absolutely expect him to be further engaged in 2028 uh, if he were to lose um, this next election. Yeah. Um, just another question in here from uh, Shona Murray from Euronews. Um, By the way, let me, finish, let me finish that. There's, there's the, if I may, Michael, there's, there's, a, there's a wrinkle in this, and the, and the press will love this. There's actually a, a non-zero chance that, um, that Donald Trump runs again in 2028, and Joe Biden does not. 
you stuff to think about that simply because <laughs> of, of his age. So there's something I hadn't thought about before this this conversation today. But that's a fascinating thing to sort of uh, sort of contemplate. But I sorry I, I interrupted you. I don't know about you. My head is riddled with uh, dealing with the issue today. Well, I mean, not to talk about 2024 or indeed 2028. Uh, so look, uh, Shona Murray, from, uh, who's a frequent um, uh, attendee at our events from Euronews, and it was just maybe um, uh, tilting a little bit towards Europe, uh, if we may make it, it's going beyond your uh, immediate Northern Ireland brief, but nonetheless it all uh, ties in and in many ways, uh, given our, our own relationship here with Europe and membership of the European Union. And it is to do with the President, uh, President Trump's um, um, attitude to her towards Europe, uh, towards the European Union specifically. She says, why is uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, uh, so apparently hostile uh, to Europe? She says he's pro-Brexit, he speaks uh, negatively or disparagingly about Chancellor Merkel, yet he's much more open with Putin and Kim Jong-un, um, pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, etc., etc. So how uh, I I the antipathy, the apparent antipathy towards Europe um, the fact that, or who among the European leaders who would he consider at this stage a friend? Yeah, a really good question. I got two answers for that. I don't know. I can't assign weight to these two things. So I don't want to make it look like this is 50-50 or 90-10. These are just two considerations as you contemplate that question. Number one, the president really does not like multilateral uh, negotiations. He does not like multilateral sort of, not entities, well, that manifests itself in that fashion. He always thinks that the United States ends up getting the short end of that stick because we negotiate with everybody. We give the Spanish what they want, they give the British what they want, we give, we give everybody what they want. That's one of the reasons he was not interested in doing TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a group, but very interested in doing it in one-off discussions. Um, harder to do, slower to do, but he's absolutely convinced um, that, that America gets a better deal that way. Uh, would history bear him out? I think that, 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 that that's certainly you could make that argument. There's arguments to the other to the other extreme as well. Um, so that that factors in anytime dealing with Europe. Let me give you an example, Michael. Um, that I, I was over in February. I had a chance to meet with my um, my counterpart at the time, Sir Edward Lister, who was uh, Chief of Staff to Boris Johnson. And I was there in I think it's mid February at the time to warn about COVID. Um, and the message I had delivered that time was I said, Sir Edward, you got to help us if you can. Uh, can you talk to the Italians? And he said, why? I said, well, because our analysis indicates they are the last European country that still is allowing uh, unobstructed, unrestricted flights from mainland China into Europe. And this COVID thing could get out of hand. We need to figure out a way to get them to screen or stop or do whatever. And he says, well, Mick, that's, 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 that's their own call. It's not a European call. And I sort of sat back in my chair and I said, Sir Edward, listen, I'll be perfectly candid with you. That's what we can't stand about dealing with Europeans. Every time we want you to deal um, as, as one, like on this matter, you tell us it's up to the individual countries. And then every time we want you to deal as individual countries, like on trade, you tell us you can't, you have to deal as a group. And it's extraordinarily frustrating to us. Of course, he laughed and said that was the reason, one of the reasons they were leaving the European Union as well. So, um, so that sort of that, the unilateral or the bilateral mentality of an American, is, of many Americans, is, is, is hard to, to, is a square peg into a round hole of, of the multilateralist view um, that is, 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 is predominant in Europe. I don't think either one is right or wrong or more right or more wrong than the other. They're just different. So that's half of your answer, part of your answer. The other part is the president is just a very um, uh, relationship driven person. He has personal, um, he believes in a personal con a connectivity, personal relationship. Um, and he just doesn't have that. He didn't make that connection with Angela Merkel, did not make that connection with Macron. He did with, um, with, um, with Boris Johnson. And by the way, he did with, um, with, um, with Leo before, uh, excuse me, um, uh, the, the Taoiseach when, uh, when Leo was the Taoiseach. Um, uh, he had that type of connection. The best example I can give is of Scott Morrison in Australia. We came out very early on in the administration and started threatening all sorts of, 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 of trade uh, restrictions on Australia. And then Scott Morrison through good diplomacy reached out, established a relationship with the president. And now I think that that connection is stronger than it's ever been. Ditto the relationship the president had with Shinzo Abe in, uh, in, in Japan before Shinzo left. I don't know now what the status is of the relationship with the president and the new, uh, new uh, prime minister because I'm not there. But you put those two things together. It's that multilateral versus bilateral perspective of, of things and that focus on a personal relationship. And I think um, Europe uh, using those two factors goes right to the bottom of the list. Okay. Um, there's another, a uh, lot of <laughs> journalistic questions here. Uh, well, maybe I'm sure there are. Yeah, an hour press conference. That's right. I'm going to have to wrap yeah, it at 11 uh, on this, Michael, but that's, I'll oh, get about 10 minutes left. 
I feel as if I'm convening a press conference yeah, here. Um, that's okay. So, but in any event, I assume uh, it's the also, same question your your supporters and members would have if they had a chance to ask some questions. So yeah, well, they're all they're all good questions. Uh, the, um, Gronya from the Journal.ie. Uh, um, could I ask two questions? Well, we'll see how far we get. Sure. Says, she says, could I get the ambassador's response to this statement from uh, the French economy minister, Bruno Le Marie? Uh, and she quotes, uh, uh, the, I'm sure the economy minister saying, let's not kid ourselves. The United States has not been a friendly partner to European states for several years now. Uh, whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump is elected by Americans tonight or tomorrow, nothing, nothing changes this st uh, strategic fact. The American continent has detached itself from the European continent. And maybe just on that point, yesterday on uh, one of our webinars, one of our events, we had Federica Mogherini, the outgoing, uh, the former um, um, foreign policy um, um, uh, uh, commissioner, and uh, she talked about uh, the transatlantic relationship having been damaged. Uh, you know, um, uh, over over the last number of years, is that your sense that that you know you know transatlantic relations um, would now need to be uh, rebooted in some way, uh, or do you think indeed that they ever were indeed damaged? Uh, damage is, a, is such a strong term. Impacted. I mean, let me let me let me do a, a, an epilogue to the answer I just gave. Let's not kid ourselves if we're being candid, and clearly we are. Um, the, the, a lot of the Europeans are just as relationship as relationship driven as Donald Trump are. They don't like Donald Trump. He's 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 different than what they're used to. He, you know, he, he's not been this cordial. He's not a George Bush type of Republican. He's not a Barack Obama type of, of leader. He's a different kind of person. And that type of person doesn't rise to, uh, to levels of leadership in Europe because of, of a variety of cultural differences. And I get that. Again, I don't think one makes that right or wrong. It's just different. Um, do I think there's been damage? No. Do I think it was time to take, have candid conversations about um, equal and balanced treatment? Yes. I'll give an example dealing with Canada because I'm not as familiar with the details of, of European trade, but the one in Canada, I'm sure there's examples we could find if we look hard enough between the US and Europe, which is that we used to have uh, what's called the de minimis rule. But if you're shipping something from, the can from Canada into the US, and it was, it was it cost less than $400. We didn't pay any attention to the tariff. It was a de minimis rule. Everybody I think on this call knows what that means, okay? If the good flowed the other way from the US into Canada, the de minimis, de minimis level was $14. That is not fair. That is not equitable. And it, I do not believe that us raising that issue um, means that we are being bad neighbors, bad partners, and we're damaging our relationship. That's, that's, that's just, that's something, listen, we did a lot of things um, over the course of our, of our, of the 20th century, the post-World War history to help fight against communism. And I think what we did was correct. Um, and we obviously proved to be correct because we won that battle. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the tools that we used were trade driven, for example, we gave preferential trade treatment to folks as part of our foreign policy to counterbalance what was happening in the Soviet Union. I think it's fair to have a discussion as to whether or not that fundamental um, uh, underpinning still um, is, a is a good basis for international trade for the United States in the 21st century. Again, I think asking that question, raising that issue doesn't make us bad neighbors. By the way, let me, let me, let me push back on, on, what, uh, on the first part of that question about the comment from the French and say this, I'll answer it this way. I have felt zero animosity, none whatsoever, not a hint of it in my work so far in Belfast, in Dublin, or in, uh, in, in London. Um, the relationships are still very, very strong. Is it different in France? I don't know. That's not, that's not my area of expertise. It's not my area of study. I have been welcomed everywhere. Everyone who's come from the United States, from, from, um, uh, from the UK and the Republic and, and Northern Ireland have been welcomed in my country and will continue to be so. So no, I, I can't speak to the larger relationships because it's not my portfolio. But the relationship between the United Kingdom uh, and the United States remains extraordinarily strong. And the very, very, and I don't want to use the word special relationship, but the familial relationship between the United States and Ireland uh, has, in my mind, has never been stronger than it is today. So I dismiss um, uh, the, 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 the comments by, by the, the, the French representative. But again, it's outside my area of expertise. 
Okay, can I just bring you back uh, maybe to a point you made in your um, earlier presentation? Um, and there's a few queries in on it, and I think it's something that's now <laughs> running actively on Twitter, but um, from Arthur Beasley in the Financial Times, he says, hi, Michael, hi, Mick. Um, based on what Simon Coveney said to you, how precisely could Europe use, quote, uh, commercial aviation, unquote, as a lever or a lever against the UK in a no-deal situation? So a bit of interest in that, maybe maybe if you could just yeah. maybe clarify. Don't, don't know. Did not go in, did not go into specifics. The one that, the, what I remember from Simon was we talked, we talked, I did ask him a question about trade, and he said, trading goods, he said, no, state aid was a lot more important. My guess is there's, and by the way, he also mentioned fishing, as I, as I commented on earlier. And my guess is there's an interconnection between state aid and fishing. In fact, I'm sure there is. And there may well be an interconnection between state aid and commercial transportation. I don't know. But um, what I took away from the meeting was that British Airways continues to want to fly from London to the continent. And that if the Europeans got really, really upset, they could make that they can make uh, BA's life very difficult. So um, no, I did not go into the specifics of how that would happen, how that would or would not. Okay, okay, we're we're going to get to, we're coming towards the back of the our hour now, uh, Mick. So and just uh, bring us back to we want to bring it back to the island of Ireland, if I may. Um, and uh, sure, <laughs> here one from. Uh, one from Ambassador uh, Jackie Potzel, who's a good friend of ours, uh, uh, the German ambassador here in Dublin. Uh, she says, would uh, Ambassador Mulvaney have an opinion on the Shared Island Initiative uh, by the Taoiseach, uh, Michal Martin? Uh, and that's a question also echoed by, echoed by Mary uh, Murphy from University College Cork, who says, or who asks, has the ambassador taken an interest in the Taoiseach's Shared Island Unit? What is his perspective on the initiative? And does he envisage that the U U.S. Um, uh, can or should play a role in supporting it? Yeah, I'll stop. Uh, I'll start with the beginning and then I'll move forward. Is that can or should? Uh, I look at it this way. We will go where we are invited. Um, this is, this is uh, but the classic example I give on, for example, the internal markets bill is the flow of goods from Northern Ireland to GB. And I was talking to Brandon, I'm like, Brandon, I don't understand how that's any difference in a flow of goods from North Carolina to South Carolina. That's an internal matter. We're not going to stick our nose in where it's not wanted. Uh, you extend that now to the Shared Island Initiatives. I did talk uh, to Michal Martin about it. And what I said was, look, I, we think it's great. It's entirely consistent with and, 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 and reinforcing of the Good Friday agreements. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, that's great. If staying away is the best thing we can do to help that, then just let us know. That's, that's, that's great. That's that's listen. I talked to um, I talked to uh, Richard Haas uh, about this position right after the president made the uh, the nomination. I talked to uh, 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 Mitchell Reese about it as well. Uh, we have mutual uh, several common friends, and I said, look, it strikes me how how far am I off on this, guys? If I think that the role here is to just be fair with everybody, be friends with everybody when that when, when that when that's necessary, push back on everybody um, if, if that if the circumstances dictate. But generally, just be a fair broker. Try and be liked by everybody. But if you can't be, be equally disliked by everybody. Um, so that if the time comes and they're looking for somebody to help out as a trusted third party, that's the role we can play. And they both said that if I managed to do that, I would have been a success. I think, by the way, they've managed to do it. And I can prove it to you. I think Mitchell Reese has been named by the IRC as a representative there. So there's an American sitting on that board. That's the credibility that he was, he was able to build up during his time in this office. Um, the Shared Island Initiative is, uh, is something that we would support if asked, um, and something that we would um, be happy to sort of let run its own course if asked that. And I know that Michal and I will continue to talk about it, and do, we will do what we can to encourage you, because we think it's entirely consistent with what we see as a, as a promising future for the island. Yeah, but just uh, finally, Mick, uh, you mentioned a few of your predecessors there, Richard, Richard Haas and um, Mitchell Reese, and indeed uh, there has been... Um, uh, an illustrious um, uh, cohort of, of, of people who have uh, uh, done this job since um, uh, George Mitchell was appointed in 1995. And I happened to have been in the Oval Office that day when he was appointed wow. by uh, President uh, Clinton, not having any idea, of course, uh, the, you know, from that, um, that beginning, as it were, the, where the, the future years were going to lead us, uh, including up to the agreement in, in 98. But I haven't, or maybe I've missed it. Uh, has uh, um, a, a, a Vice President uh, uh, Biden, has he indicated that there is going to be a, a successor if it were to be the case that he was to become the president, that he's going to have a special envoy? I haven't seen it, but um, maybe I, I don't want to put too much into it, but. And you should, and you should. Let me, let me put that one to rest. You should not read too much into that. I would absolutely 100% anticipate uh, that they would fill the position relatively quickly. Um, I've, I've been in communication. With, I, don't, I don't think it would be someone like Brendan Boyle 
I don't think it'd be somebody from the Irish, uh, active in the Irish caucus, because you, to a certain extent, if you pick someone who is uh, so pro-Ireland, it, it, it's difficult to maybe under certain circumstances to get uh, the credibility that you want with all the parties. Um, so, but, uh, so I don't ex expect it to be Brendan or Richie Neal, but I absolutely expect him to fill the position in relatively short order. And as I mentioned before, I'll continue to serve as, as long as people want to continue to meet with me in an informal capacity. I continue to have um, relationships in both parties. Again, this is not a partisan position. If the vice president were to ask me to stay on for six months until he found somebody, I would happily do so, um, which is, I guess, to say I could serve in a Biden administration, which again, will probably make news um, and get me in trouble with some of my Republican friends. But that's just how bipartisan this issue is in the United States of America. So no, please do not read too much into it. Um, if anything, I think uh, that the Biden administration uh, would take it much, if not more, interest in Northern Ireland because of his, his personal uh, histories and so forth. So now I wouldn't reach much into it. OK, uh, just one final question unrelated to any of this. Um, you served at the absolute um, epicenter of uh, global power and the uh, just adjacent to the, to the Oval Office in, in the White House as Chief of Staff. And leaving aside personalities, um, what surprised you, if anything, about being there and the work that you had to do, or was everything exactly as you anticipated it should be? Um, I had the benefit of having worked around the Oval Office for two years. Uh, the Office yeah. of Management and Budget is one of those offices that nobody knows about. We like it that way. Um, it is generally considered as one of the most powerful places in Washington, D.C., mostly because no one knows how it works, so we intend to keep it like that. Um, and for that reason, I was in the Oval Office interacting with the president a lot during my first two years. So I, I, was, not, <clears throat> I was not surprised by anything. What I will remember is, um, the, um, is the adrenaline. Um, that, that's what you live on when you are there. There's a reason that the life expectancy of a chief of staff, especially in the first term, is so short. I served 15 months. I expected to serve six. It's why I was only asked to serve six. That's why I was acting chief of staff. Um, Joe, uh, Barack Obama had four chiefs of staff in his first term. It looks like President will, uh, Trump will have four as well. Um, you live on the adrenaline. You don't sleep much. Everything that you do is on the front page of the New York Times and CNN and the Washington Post every single day. And that can wear on you after a while. There's a reason that presidents age as much as they do during their terms in office. Go back and look at pictures of Jimmy Carter before and after George Bush, especially Barack Obama. And then, by the way, stunningly, go look at pictures of Donald Trump. I don't think he's aged a bit, which is surprising to me. Um, but um, no, it was uh, it was a, a truly a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that. I would do it again for a future president to, under the proper circumstances. But um, I wouldn't change it a bit. I'm glad that I did it. But uh, the surprises, now the surprises were policy and what happened around the world and uh, not, um, not in dealing with the president because I had known him fairly well by the time I took the job. We're nothing if not punctual in the IIEA. We're exactly on three o'clock, which is a little bit earlier where you are. Um, it's going to be another long day into the night. And indeed, have you all not changed your clocks yet? Have you not gone to no. standard time? We're still, we're, we're still, we're, now, we're five hours behind you, or sorry, ahead of you. So. I don't know what time you are of the day now, but uh, I'm 11. You should be. You should be four o'clock. Are you three o'clock? Oh, we're, we're about to, we're, we're about to finish our day here nearly now. But in any event, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say thank you to you uh, being with us. Uh, you know, just at this incredible time in, in American history, um, just to express our thanks. I think in in terms of the work you've done in Northern Ireland and the fact that you you know America has um, and on a bipartisan basis has, has stood has stood by us and stood with the issues and then kept itself interested and involved and supportive of the Good Friday Agreement. I think all of us on the line would, would, would share um, that that is a priority issue and just to have the United States at our back uh, looking after and protecting uh, something that's been really important for our island I think is something that we'd be eternally grateful for. So listen thank you good luck with these days we're glad to know that you're going to stay involved in whatever capacity uh, but um, I we look forward to welcoming you to the IAA in whatever capacity at some stage in the future. Michael, all the best. Thanks very much.